Oh, so you're going to wear them here. Sorry, well, if you ever want to give that away, I'll be at your yard sale. <laughs> Need some blue, some gold. Yeah, oh, oh I yeah. exactly why you can't wear
They should interview you about what you're yeah. doing. Yeah, well, we had, we had a good hour and a half interview with the editorial board. I think they haven't run it yet, about, yeah. you know, three weeks ago, maybe. Yeah. But it was far ranging. And, yeah. That's not the same as being interviewed by one of their writers. So I think that's, yeah. what, that's what they need, yeah. is to interview you for, yeah. for a story. Yeah. <clears throat> Or and even a segment on the, uh, the TV news program. Mm. Have you been interviewed for that? No, not yet. Yeah. I will at the beginning, way back when during the transition. Yeah. But since maybe then, I'll suggest that to yeah. them. Too. I'll, I'll talk to Cam and suggest that. Get everybody to come closer. Well, I guess not. We need to, I, I, it always reminds me of class when that used to really bug me when people. It doesn't matter if you're an instructor. You I still know. Do that. I still want people to be closer. So I, by the way, I did get with Steve Burrell after seeing Ed reminded me. He had asked about. He liked the idea of the steering or advisory group, excuse me, for the service team. Okay. I wondered if we could do something similar for ITS. Yeah. So I wrote to Steve and said, explain, and his response was that there's already a number of ways that faculty could plug in, and I suggested that he reach out to you and maybe come and talk to the FSEC about okay. that and then have a dialogue about, you know, how to best okay. have input into how they're doing. Uh-huh. So more pointed. Okay. All right. That's one of the nice things. <coughs> Hold it. Good afternoon, folks. I would like to call this meeting of the general faculty to order at 3.02 p.m. Thank you for being here. I would like to make a correction to the agenda. The agenda actually has four items, not three. The discussion on shared governance should be listed as item number three, and the uh, teaching stream proposal is item number four. With that correction, may I have a motion to accept the agenda? So, uh, can I have a second? Second. All in favor? Say aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Kate Ellis. I am a professor in the College of Arts and Letters, and I serve as the president of the Faculty Senate. I would like to thank President Cruz Rivera and Provost Poyesi for joining the faculty today for this meeting. I would specifically like to thank the provost's office for providing the support for this meeting today. It is my very great pleasure to begin this meeting in recognition of Joya Woods, who led the Faculty Senate for four years. Her tireless efforts on behalf of the faculty at NAU, championing the principles of shared governance during a most challenging period, promoting the best within the Senate, and helped lead us all to last year's national, national search for a new university president. On a personal note, I thank you for your mentorship and the model of faculty leadership you have provided me. On behalf of the Faculty Senate and the generosity of its members, I present Joya Woods with a tabletop plaque in recognition of her four years as Senate president and dinner for two at Dahl and DeLuca Ristorante Italiano in Sedona. Thank you for your service. And truly, thank you for your service. 
on to the business. Um, according to the Constitution of the Faculty Senate, a meeting of the general faculty is to be called by the Faculty Senate President once a semester. I have called this meeting specifically to provide the faculty the opportunity to hear from and engage with our new University President, Dr. Cruz Rivera, on the topic of shared governance and faculty participation in university governance. The Arizona Board of Regents assigns to the faculty under the title of shared governance primary responsibility for such fundamental areas as curriculum, subject matter and pedagogy, academic standards, administ um, sorry, fundamental uh, research, scholarship and creative activity, faculty status, and other aspects of university life that relate to the educational project process subject to the authority of ABOR and the administrative authority of the university president. We have successfully conducted our work in these areas in collaboration with the administration for years, most recently on the development of the new general studies program, which was approved by ABOR and is now being implemented. The non-tenure track council of the faculty senate developed the idea of the proposed teaching stream and collaborated with the provost office on the further refinement of the proposal in 2019 and 2020. The proposal was tabled due to the pandemic, but our new administration examined the proposal, found value in it, and wanted to continue that collaboration. And the second topic on today's agenda is a direct result of the ongoing partnership between faculty and administration on this proposal. What I have learned in my time on the Faculty Senate is when faculty refer to shared governance, they are often combining faculty predominance in curriculum, academic standards, research, scholarship, and creative activity, and faculty status with the broader topic of faculty participation in university governance. And they are two different topics. <clears throat> Uh, we also we are concerned with issues of budget and budget allocation, the development and implementation of the university strategic plan, university organization, and the administration of the university, and how those larger topics impact the work we do as faculty. As we have a new university president, I felt the appropriate topic for the first meeting of the general faculty <coughs> during President Cruz Rivera's new administration would be shared governance, and in particular, how he approaches engaging with faculty on the broader topic of faculty participation in university governance. President Cruz Rivera. Thank you, President Ellis, and thanks to all the faculty who are here today um, to be part of this conversation and those that are watching online. I thought that what I would do is just spend a few minutes sharing some high-level general thoughts on university governance and the interplay with shared governance. Um, and then perhaps opening it up to a conversation, understanding that the topic of university governance slash shared governance is really an ongoing conversation between the administration, the faculty, the staff, and the students, and all other stakeholders um, affiliated with the university. So really taking a very, very high level uh, and a step back, um, in terms of university governance, it's important to remind ourselves that the people of Arizona elect a governor and a legislature, and that the governor appoints and the legislature approves the members of the Arizona Board of Regents, who then in turn delegates the advancement of the educational attainment, knowledge creation, and workforce development to the presidents of each of the three public universities. Now, ABRA expects that the presidents advance these issues in the aggregate, so there is an executive council of all three presidents and the executive director of the board um, and that they do so by mobilizing and engaging their local university communities and the myriad stakeholders associated with the universities in the advancement of each individual university's mission and the progression of their strategic and operational goals. After delegating that on the presidents, then ABOR holds the presidents accountable on behalf of the people of Arizona. So those are the real uh, governance uh, leaders for ably discharging their responsibility within the complex structural, legal, political, cultural, ethical, financial constraints that characterize the higher education space. So that's sort of a very broad level. Now, 
the way I view the interplay between shared governance and university governance um, is really uh, with three, uh, through three lenses, if you will. First is just the recognition that the best way to advance a university's mission is for the president and his or her executive team to create the formal and informal consultative and deliberative structures that were allowed for broad consultation that in turn will lead to the best informed decisions. All perspectives add value to the decision making, but it is clear, as President Ellis said earlier, and, that, and it is codified in uh, ABOR and this faculty senate's uh, documents, that the faculty um, perspectives must have greater weight, must have predominance in policy decisions relating to curricula, pedagogy and course design, academic standards and student success, and the faculty personnel process. And because at the end, which is the third point, at the end of the day, universities are really academic enterprises at their core. The best decisions are made, the best administrative and executive decisions are made when faculty, along with other stakeholders, are active participants in informing the university's work more broadly in the areas, as President Ellis mentioned, uh, including budget, facilities, etc. So, ultimately, the way I view uh, shared governance, and that I hope that you have gotten a, a glimpse of uh, through specific actions that we've done in the last few months, is that it is important in order to advance the mission that we create the structures that will allow us to ensure that we get the best thinking of the university community in driving decisions. It's, it's a luxury, really, to have a faculty, to have a staff council, to have a student government that is actively participating in decision making. And it's something that needs to be nurtured and something that I'm very much committed to doing. Uh, some of you may uh, have noticed uh, along the past few months uh, some ways in which we have done that. Uh, from the way in which we appointed the uh, new provost, VP of Student Affairs, and VP of Research, how we engage with the campus community and the faculty in particular on those um, appointments, um, how we have handled the strategic uh, roadmap process, which not only has been a consultative process that we've built uh, in consultation with faculty, staff, and students, but that we've made sure that we figure out what are the vehicles that we need to put in place so that everybody gets to participate or at least that we remove as many barriers as possible. And so that's why we have listening sessions, why we have anonymous forms, emails, um, and we have a crowdsourcing tool uh, so that folks can uh, provide their, their input. Um, and I could mention a few more. I think uh, uh, one that I'm particularly um, uh, proud of, um, which is uh, really the, the uh, brainchild of our provost, is the Academic Leadership Assembly, because I, I think it provides a process for all of these issues where faculty have ideas and have a sense of urgency that the administration attend them, that they are placed in a proper structure so that we can, uh, in, a, in a very structured way, um, take care of them. So that's really it. There's not much more uh, to that. Um, it's really a conversation. Um, it's really demonstrating that um, you value shared governance through your actions at the end of the day. And I know that I will be held accountable to that and, and welcome it. I will say that um, in, my, in my time in higher ed, I can perhaps share three signs of strong governance that um, I've experienced um, when you know that there's a healthy governance in place. The first is when um, the conversations between the administration, the faculty, the staff, the students, the alumni, you name it, right? Uh, we have the elected officials, the regents. is collegial rather than adversarial. There's no need to be loud, to be heard, or adversarial to be taken seriously. When that happens, when that is in place, you know that you have good governance. There's also good governance when you look at a campus or university community and you see that there's more time spent on securing securing the coherence of the efforts of that community to advance the mission than time spent addressing unproductive internal conflicts. There are productive conflicts, and we will embrace them. But if we are collegial in our approach and we're structured, they will be productive as opposed to unproductive, and they will help advance our mission, which is ultimately what we want to do. And finally, the third point is that you know you have good, uh, strong governance when there is trust and 
little intentionality bias because sometimes there will be decisions that have to be made with limited or less than desired consultation. But if we have built a strong partnership, there will be time to discuss why, how, and what values drove that decision rather than immediately escalating into some form of unproductive uh, conflict. Finally, actually, I should have done 10 like David Letterman, but <laughs> I'll do a fourth one. Um, that we all remember, everybody in the campus community knows that there are many, many issues. We have a very complex enterprise and that in reality, there's very little that can be addressed in isolation of other important issues, right? And so that's why we need structure and why we need to um, pace our conversations and have multi-year plans so that um, we can um, address those things in due order um, and have confidence that they will be addressed. So with that, I'll stop. Those are just, again, some very high level thoughts and I'm happy to take any questions. If you have questions, we do have a live mic in the room. Um, please don't ask a question without the mic. Is there any in the room? Do we wanna ask one of the, who has the, Jaime, who has the question from online? Audrey, do you? So this is a question that was submitted anonymous, anonymously through the Qualtrics survey and it reads as recent proposals to move academic programs out of online and innovative educational initiatives and into departments on the mountain campus seem to have been made with minimal input from the faculty and others impacted. How can faculty input be incorporated in a more inclusive and transparent manner to maintain faculty governance over academic programs and ensure that program and student needs are best served? Thank you for the question. My understanding is that that is a, um, a, a still an ongoing process. And so I am sure that given the, the values that I've expressed today that um, the consultation is moving forward and uh, decisions will be communicated at the, at the right time when, when there's a convergence of those uh, issues. Um, and I look forward to the balance of the conversation, the recommendations that come out uh, when the provost presents them. I don't know if the provost wants to add anything. Just re reinforcing your uh, statement about this being very much in process. That is to say that there are dialogues going on in different areas of campus around uh, the potential of those moves. And, and maybe to refer back to the one of your points about the significance of coherence in relation to mission, uh, that this issue is being driven by a consideration of how we could best situate our academic programs and the faculty uh, that drive them uh, in relation to a re-energized sense of our uh, mission to serve 20 different locations throughout the state of Arizona in different ways and, and what that might imply about how we best organize our efforts, invest our resources, uh, and think about the platforms in a way that we have in place to develop further academic programs. Uh, those are the larger considerations that are bringing that, uh, that question to bear in, in different locations on campus. Any questions from the room? Thank you. Um, is this on? Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, uh, and thank you for identifying, you know, the, the three sort of hallmark features. And thank you, Kate, for opening with this idea of um, uh, being mindful of not conflating faculty governance with, you know, university governance. I and mean, we have a board and their responsibility, of course, and charge is to govern the university according to our mission. But we have responsibility and the right to participate in the construction of that mission. And that's how I see the, the roadmap functioning in particular. Mm -hmm. So I'm grateful for that opportunity. So thank you. 
Um, I have a sort of um, discreet question um, now that I'm a chair of a department, and I know that these, uh, these discussions have been ongoing for several years, and um, I, I, I guess I'm wondering what, how we can imagine the chairs as a body to participate in faculty governance and shared governance. Um, we know that the Senate is the primary body wherein we exercise uh, shared governance, and, and I applaud that. I think it's appropriate. Um, and we know that there are different entities around campus who have different sort of consultatory and different responsibilities, which is appropriate. Um, but in the past few years, we've stumbled along and across the proper role of chairs in terms of governance. Um, chairs occupy uh, a dis a pretty distinct position. Um, uh, they are to represent their faculty and promote their, their units. They are also, you know, meant to act as um, uh, 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 <clears throat> go-betweens, you know, in terms of upper administration. But I believe that chairs also have um, a lot to offer and a lot of expertise, and they really have their ears to the ground in certain ways that maybe other bodies do not. So I'm wondering how we can continue talking productively about the role of chairs in this, sure. in this idea of shared governance. Thanks. Well, thank you for, for the question. You're totally right. Uh, chairs um, are positioned in a very important and unique place within the university. It's where policy and practice meet. And so it's really important to ensure that as we are advancing policy and practice that uh, we are gathering the, the information um, and the thoughts and perspectives of our chairs. I think that uh, we've attempted, and I'll let the provost talk a little bit more about uh, that, um, to, to get that, to have a balance between um, broad participation and, and nimbleness. Um, the reality is that the university is facing challenges, and we have to be very nimble in, in our decision making, and we have to aspire to have the best possible information we can have, but within a limited time span. So the academic leadership uh, assembly and collaborative, I think, are ways in which chairs are, the voice of chairs are being brought in. But that is not to say that chairs cannot autoconvene and help inform work. For example, um, it would be totally appropriate for chairs within a particular college or across the university to look at the strategic roadmap as it stands today or as it will stand in the early spring and collectively put their thoughts uh, together. Um, so I think that's... Um, uh, the way I, I, I view it, but the provost may have her own thoughts. Well, there's a lot of years of chair experience in this room. <laughs> That's all I got to say. Uh, so I'm sure there's a lot of people that have different thoughts about this than, than my own. But, uh, you know, Joya, I, I guess the way I think about it, and I hope I don't... Uh, I'm going to use the uh, terminology that comes from a different arena to say th that there's a certain kind of intersectionality uh, in the position of chairs in the university, and in particular, they're at the intersection of shared governance and university governance, is the way I see it. That is what makes the role of chair or director uh, among uh, the most challenging uh, in the university, maybe short of the president. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, it, it is, because in a way, if you think about it, you're the stewards of many forms of shared governance that, that flow through the academic unit that you lead, say curriculum and faculty personnel process and things like that. At the same time, uh, chairs and directors are a part of the academic leadership, which is really a, a dimension uh, of university governance as well. And so... Uh, I do think that is a, a very uh, interesting space to be in, and in the, in the more practical uh, question that you've posed about how to give greater voice to, to the maybe unique perspectives that people in, occupying that space may have, there are or is the very two practical challenges around that. One is it's too big of a group to just incorporate into the assembly, which is something that we've thought about. And, and I do have an active consideration right now of a, a request to think about different ways to involve chairs more directly in that, either to add a meeting, have more frequent of the summits that we haven't yet scheduled, or some other means. Uh, and while 
Uh, you certainly, uh, as the President just suggested, have the opportunity as a group to self-regulate, if you will, and self-organize, uh, convene, and, and we've encouraged that and, you know, provide your input in some collective way around key issues like the road mapping. Uh, I know that that doesn't substitute for being at a table. The, the other practical issue that uh, having a separate table brings, which is one that a number of us have experienced in different ways, either in our role as chairs or perhaps in our role as deans, uh, is that if you have two separate groups having conversations about the same thing, not in a sequence, which is what I hoped the assembly would, would rectify, then you get this whole thing that we tended to have, especially when they're, and maybe the difference is, I'm thinking uh, as I say this, that there was more of a communication that was unidirectional in that case, but words are different in one meeting versus words in another meeting, and then people go around trying to figure out what the heck is what, you know? Uh, and I, that was a very troubling dynamic that I don't want to see repeated. So maybe with the new way we're working, there might be other ways to manage that aspect of the situation that won't be so problematic. But uh, I do hear that, uh, that there's a great interest on the part of chairs of having more direct participation. Uh, thank you all uh, for meeting with us today. Uh, I'm Paul Lenz from Politics and International Affairs. Uh, my question uh, has more to do with the strategic roadmap. Uh, the uh, version two, I've already sent my comments to Lori Dixon, and she's going to share them uh, in the planning, further planning meetings. My question is for both of you. Uh, on the document, it talked a lot about three years from now, but uh, knowing what I know about uh, politics, three years doesn't really matter all that much right now. What we care about is today or tomorrow, what's impacting us in the present. So my question to both of you is, what does success look like for you after year one? So by May, June of 2022, how will you define success? That's a great question. And I think that uh, one way that we will define success is if we have, um, through this participatory process, arrived at a set of goals and objectives that really, when taken together, over time um, will position us as national leaders in our ability to deliver equitable post-secondary value. Um, that we have uh, also in this year um, set a foundation that will allow us to accelerate progress in the way that we're able to differentiate NAU from ASU and U of A in terms of the service that we provide to the state, uh, especially on, on the areas of, of access and um, in our ability to place graduates in uh, roles across the state of Arizona that has a multiplicative effect um, in allied health, in nursing, in teaching, in uh, climate and environmental sciences, et cetera. Um, so I think that um, we will, we should, I think, know that we, we, success will be momentum, if that makes any sense. I think that if we are at a place where we, we have clear um, goals and objectives, a clear guiding principle. Um, the state recognizes that uh, we have differentiated value uh, from our two sister institutions, and uh, we are given the due consideration for that. I think that would be a uh, success. And if we can do it all in love and harmony, more so. <laughs> Paul, that's a great question. I don't know if I've thought as much about it, but I'll say that for one thing, and this is more of a, a internally focused uh, response, which is that I will feel like we've been successful if we can have these kinds of dialogues and you know difficult conversations about really complex matters that, that face the institution. And another way to put it might be that faculty can lean into their participation in university government governance and in turn we meaning academic leaders myself the president deans and everybody else can lean into shared governance to use a overused phrase but you know what i mean 
uh, in ways that we can speak directly and frankly and, and understand that we may have different perspectives and that we may not fundamentally come to a, a perfect agreement, but we can agree on how we need to move forward in the best interests of the institution. That would be a, a marker of success to, in my mind. The other thing that I would hope that we can do, and, and the first is a requisite for this second item, I guess, is uh, I think that one of the challenges we are going to face going forward in the academic division particularly is that if we embrace the principles, the, the, the larger goal, and then some of the uh, articulations that we have currently in the roadmap in the form of the objectives uh, that are ways to realize that larger goal, uh, is that we are going to need together to take a really close look at our academic programs and, and figure out how do we adapt them, move them forward in, in such a way that they will serve our students best, serve the different communities that our students come from best, serve our stakeholders uh, best. And also related to that is what what are the new areas of programming that we might need to consider? And how are we going to manage to add new programs in an environment where we are not just getting buckets of money uh, funneled into us, except in maybe one narrow case, uh, in the case of some of the health professions, we are getting some resources, which is great. So those are some challenging things that we will have to do, you know, work together. We are going to have to, in other words, evolve this university. Uh, in the ways that it's interesting how research and scholarship and creativity kind of evolve of their own energy or momentum, just because that's the way things go in those arenas. But when it comes to curriculum, there's a, it's much harder for that dynamic to play out. There's so many things that get sort of put in place in such a material way that it makes it harder to move with a discipline or with a profession or with the larger world. I'm going to add to that um, with Karen said, faculty leaning in. I'm going to say faculty leaning in without fear. Yeah. Faculty have functioned from a position of fear. They've been afraid to speak out. They've been afraid to speak up. They've been afraid to put their voice to their comment. I mean, their name, I'm sorry, their name to their comments. And a really good goal for the administration and the faculty is that in a year, faculty are not afraid to speak up and say things that are counter to what the administration is saying. That is a position of power for the administration and especially for the faculty. I have had so many faculty contact me, and I know Joya experienced the same thing, of faculty reaching out and saying, I want this comment, I want to find, but don't use my name. Don't use my name. And that would be a huge step for all faculty and the community as a whole if faculty are no longer functioning from a place of fear like that. Yeah, hi, Alexandra Carpino. I'm the parliamentarian of the faculty senate, and a lot of confusion comes from the fact that we have such outdated documents <laughs> that, um, you know, a constitution from 2003, bylaws from 2013. So I just was wondering, I know you're in conversations about updating these documents. If you could maybe speak a little bit to what you find um, positive in the current do in the revisions that have come forward, um, and then maybe what some of, what are some of the challenges that perhaps you see that that we need to to work on sure. as a Senate. Thank you. Um, I'll say that uh, my expectation is that we will have new documents in the spring. Yes. Um, <laughs> And I will uh, let uh, President Ellis and Provost Pugliese say a little bit more because they have been directly involved. But what I've seen so far, what I like um, is th there's a, a additional clarity um, around university governance and, and shared governance. And I think that will be helpful um, as we move forward. But I will turn it over. <laughs> so much work over so many <laughs> years has gone into this. And um, Joya Woods and Bruce Fox and, La and so many people um, have been working on this process. And um, the a constitution, a, a proposed constitution and bylaws was presented to President Cruz Rivera upon his arrival at NAU. And there were questions and concerns, because there's always going to be, and it was not unexpected with a new administration that there would be new and different questions. 
to that end, <laughs> Provost Bugliese, Lori Dixon, and I have been meeting weekly or longer. <laughs> Um, in some case, and uh, we have a constitution that I also then sent back to Joya and Bruce for their review, and they were happy with the changes and the revisions that were in process. Um, and we're we're in process. The goal is to this semester, before the end of this semester, um, get the uh, a working document, not that will be approved by the FS by the FSEC or the full Senate, but a working document to um, the legal, both to the president and to legal, to NAU, the uh, council office, for review. Because that's been one of the challenges that we've had is that the faculty senate has approved a, a, a constitution before it's gone to council's office for review. So I'm kind of switching up the process. So we will get it to the president and we will get it to council's office at the same time that it will also come back to members of the FSEC for review. Once it is reviewed by the president's office and council's office and would somewhere, knock on wood, approved, then we will bring it back to the FSEC for full approval, for full review of faculty rights and responsibilities and the FSEC, and then to the full Senate. With the goal that the next meeting of the general faculty that I will call in the spring <laughs> will be to approve, the, to discuss and approve the, to discuss and then hold a vote later in the semester approving the constitution. That's the update I can provide. I don't think I have anything to add, except that I've found these dialogues that we've had as we've walked through all these words to be very helpful uh, for uh, helping me to understand better the foundations uh, of the faculty senate, for us to think together about these ideas of you know what's shared governance, what's university governance. Uh, and I guess one of the things that's important among many that in the revision of these documents is, you know, getting things not only up to date, but sort of forward looking. I mean, there's, they're so old, they have funny language in there, like distance education and stuff like that. <laughs> Liberal studies. <Yeah. laughs> and um, the other part of it is that as we discovered, we need to move forward with the constitution. Um, Lori and Karen and I have started work on the bylaws. But the first thing we need to get done is the Constitution. And so we've, we've worked on it, and we've looked at them, but we really want to push forward the Constitution. So the Constitution will come first, and then an update to the bylaws, which is a much more laborious, larger document, um, will be next in that process. But my goal as at least a one-year uh, faculty senate president, who knows, next year, would be to get both done within a total of two years. So this year and next year to have an updated current constitution and updated current bylaws by the end of next year, hopefully sooner. But this is a, um, these are big documents and there are implications as we will see with the teaching stream that get into coughs. And so you make a change to the constitution and you make a change to bylaws, it impacts coughs, it impacts the faculty. The, the ripple effect of making a change one place is massive. And you know, everybody who's worked on these documents know this. And so it's, it's a, we are working on it diligently and the goal is to move this forward in, within two years, and so, which would be actually quite an accomplishment in the first two years of President Cruz Rivera's presidency for the faculty to have updated current documents, which we haven't had since 2002, <laughs> which precedes my arrival in NAU. <laughs> Were you even born then? Yes. <laughs> yes, I was born then. <laughs> Next question. Uh, my question. My question is a, a follow-up to Alexandra's question. Um, is there any progress in updating the COFs, the Conditions of Faculty Service document? Not yet. <laughs> and that and that and that simply comes in line with if, for instance, there are ch if down the line the teaching stream proposal is moved forward. The implications of that line, of that change, is massive for COFs. And so COFs is in a holding pattern. Um, although work is proceeding on it, um, there's the review of Appendix C of COFs that's a working group right now that um, Astrid is leading up. Are there any other that would impact COFs? Um, I should think about this. Uh, 
I'm looking around to my colleagues, any other that maybe the, you know, the faculty workload group, maybe, although, you know, we, the other thing we have to figure out, and we haven't really focused on this, although it's surfaced in our conversation, is we have some things in COFs and then we have some things in the faculty handbook. And maybe we want to think about putting it all one place. I don't know what, you know, there's implications and I'm not saying I have an a priori notion of where things should go. Uh, but I do think we need to think about that question. And so there's, there are a number of things happening right now, as Kate just put very well, uh, that would change costs. And so it really in sequence, I think that needs to come later. So we've talked in the provost's office about spring being a time when we can focus on costs, uh, you know, with the Senate. But uh, I'm not sure if it's early because we have, you know, we'll have to see what makes sense in, in light of, you know, the effort it takes to change it. If we put things, render it, render changes now, then we're going to go back and have to change it again. It seems like while we're doing all this stuff, we might as well put it all together in a way that's uh, consistent. And the goal will be to not have to go backward. And if there's a, a working group dealing with COFs, I, I do think there should be a strong representation of chairs. Um, we're the ones that get kind of stuck in the middle with the COFs lack of clarity. I, I agree, yeah. Let, um, let's have, do you have any questions from online? New ones? Okay. Any new questions from online? Okay, let's have a question from Roy and then we'll go to online. I just want, I just want to follow up on the coughs um, comment and mention that combining that with the faculty handbook has, its, um, has a negative aspect insofar as a lot of the things in the faculty handbook historically have been sort of operational in nature and you want to be able to nimbly change those as needed without affecting um, underlying principles that need broader buy-in. So I would caution against an approach that combines those two documents. I actually wasn't suggesting just merging them, but just there are things that are in the faculty handbook that might, just in our conversation, certain things that might appropriately be placed with coughs, but I agree, yeah. So there's a question online. Yes, the first question, can you guys hear yeah. me? Okay. Yep. First question is, can President Cruz Rivera please speak to the role of graduate programming within the overall mission of NAU? The role of graduate programming? Well, within the overall mission of NAU, we are certainly committed to ensuring that uh, we are preparing uh, Arizonans for the new economy. Uh, one of the things you've heard me say in a few other forums is that while well, the state of Arizona is uh, among the top in the country in attracting new jobs, new high paying jobs and attracting um, new investments, it's in the bottom uh, of uh, educational attainment uh, in the country. And so those jobs would not be going to uh, Arizonans unless we really accelerate um, educational attainment, and the reality is that graduate uh, programs and graduate degrees will be increasingly important um, in Arizona's economy, so we should be right uh, front and center there uh, doing everything we can. Of course, it's uh, always, as I said earlier, nothing in isolation, so we want graduate programs, but we want more um, uh, undergraduate students, and we want more transfer students, and we want more and more and more of certain things that we need. So we need to put it all on the table and, and figure out how we're going to balance it. Questions now online. Um, thank you for this forum. Would President Cruz Rivera and Provost Pugliese say something about the challenges that they recognize slash identify NAU currently faces? Challenges that we identify? Mm -hmm. I think the challenges um, are very similar to the challenges that public higher ed institutions are facing nationwide. Um, we have an enrollment challenge. For the last four years, enrollments have been going down. Um, and when you think about the way higher ed, public higher ed institutions are funded and how they're funded in Arizona, that's a problem. That's a challenge. Um, because we have three main sources of revenue, the state, tuition and fees, and uh, grants and contracts. And so at some point, we have to figure out um, why it is that our enrollment is, is falling, how we turn that around, 
because not only because of the finances, but because of the fact that we have this huge moral responsibility to expand opportunity, right? And we know we're good at what we do. And so uh, we need to make sure that we're uh, providing access to more students across Arizona, not just in Flagstaff, but in the 20 other um, statewide sites, um, as well as online. So I think enrollment is, um, if, I, if I were <laughs> asked what the top uh, worry for me right now is, is enrollment, uh, both for the fiscal and for the um, opportunity cost for Arizonans if we don't uh, increase it. Well, I guess uh, I would say that one of the key challenges that I think we'll face that relates to a point I made earlier is that also like other institutions across the country are facing that we have to be uh, able to serve uh, a changing uh, population of students and maybe I could say an expanding population of students, especially if we think about our uh, renewed focus on serving non-metropolitan communities in the state uh, in a way that produces equitable outcomes. Uh, that means that particularly those of us uh, in the academic arena need to figure out how it is that we reach students where they are when they come to us and support them in such a way uh, academically and in other ways because we are seeing that they need other things besides academic support uh, so that they can graduate in a reasonable period of time, ideally four years or at least six, uh, without accruing a lot of debt uh, and gaining the benefit of the education we provide them in such a way that they're uh, pre well prepared for their life, a life uh, of professional success and a life of meaningful citizen citizenry or in, uh, civic engagement and all that stuff. And I think we have a lot of work to do on that front. Uh, we've done a lot of work at this university. The faculty have done a great deal of work over many years. I'm very well aware of the many innovative things that uh, faculty across NAU have done in this regard, but uh, I'm uh, also well aware that we have much more to do, uh, and it's getting harder, <laughs> I think. Uh, I think we're all of you that are teaching are seeing firsthand that the complexities of what students present to us as learners is growing, um, maybe exponentially, I don't know, that might be an overstatement, but uh, things are, are harder now than they were when I started teaching so many years ago in many regards. So that's, that's probably top of my mind. Secondly, I, I, I also think a lot about how it is that we here at NAU, particularly here in Flagstaff, but not just in Flagstaff, throughout uh, our locations in Arizona, can uh, attract uh, and retain a diverse, highly qualified faculty. That is becoming increasingly challenging, as many of you know and talk to me about all the time. That's probably one of the major topics of conversation I tend uh, to have. Uh, and then the, the intersection of the challenge of enrollment with what we need to do in regard to programming that I was talking about earlier is that obviously we're in a way, an un we're, can I say a tuition-dependent institution, uh, and so those are related in that it's the enrollment that's going to, you know, largely generate the resources that we need to do the other things that we know are important. So we've got to work in that nexus. Um, so those are the th three things I think about. I know what Kate thinks about. Um, what, what has been said, and recru recruiting qualified faculty is, we want a diverse faculty. But I know the challenges in my college, in my department, of hiring diverse faculty, in that the demand nationwide is so high for faculty that would qualify as diverse, that um, in many cases, NAU doesn't compete on that level. And um, I also know in my specific field, the diversity just isn't as high as it might be in other fields. And so uh, hiring and retaining and keeping morale and all of that and, and having faculty feel supported, that's what's gonna keep the faculty here. That's gonna keep the faculty engaged here. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges because faculty help promote and keep students here. And I know that's, you know, we need students to be here and the faculty are key to that. 
nice follow-up question online. Um, how do the provost and president envision working with the faculty senate charge diversity curriculum committee to develop the capacity to teach the new diversity requirements? That's a, a great question, and I'll let the, the provost uh, provide more details. But um, this will be a huge challenge as well, right? Um, and at the end of the day, all of the things that have been said uh, dovetail with the enrollment because it's about value. It's how are we articulating our value uh, to, to students, uh, right? Those that are coming to us straight from high school and those that may have been out in the workforce and now need uh, to upskill or reskill to be able to benefit from and contribute to the new economy. Um, so I think that as, as we work to implement this uh, general studies curriculum, there are so many opportunities for us to really um, articulate that value through our programming um, that will then uh, yield uh, incredible benefits to us. And of course, um, to the point that uh, President Ellis was making, um, we, we need to figure out a way to provide the professional development that's needed in order to make sure that we can uh, present that, uh, those new courses uh, in a way that um, adds value to our students uh, as they develop. Um, at the same time, we're doing everything we can to bring more diverse, um, highly qualified faculty who can bring their own lived experiences into the curriculum and how it's um, delivered. I guess that I see, you know, two strands there that, that the president touched upon, which is first and foremost, we need to together develop our capacity to implement this new program. And that means we all have to be students and learn. We have a lot of expertise in house, maybe not enough. Uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, and so we need to uh, figure out what is the uh, focus of, of development that's necessary so that we can grow uh, the capacity that we might already have potentially in place. Uh, and we'll need uh, the expertise of faculty from across the university to do that. You know, one dimension of that is the, the diversity element of the general studies program, but there's other elements as well that are going to take similarly some investment in our own learning uh, so that we can uh, increase our capability in this way. But yes, of course, along as we move forward in time, when we recruit new members to our community, though, that has to be foremost in our mind. And I'm happy to say uh, that in the recent round of uh, proposals and, and so forth for uh, bringing in new faculty, that the deans rose to that challenge and they all considered the, the general studies program and what its implications were for their areas in what they put forward. And so that was one of the factors that was given some priority. So we are looking at bringing in, hopefully, if we're successful, uh, new talent uh, to add to the talent we already have. Uh, in the context of those uh, hires that we'll be hopefully making this year, uh, there are ideas around how those can create clusters, some of them within colleges and some of them across colleges, uh, that are centered around uh, bringing uh, people together and supporting them once they're part of our community to make a real difference in helping us to implement this curriculum, but also to do the many other things that we need to do around diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. So uh, I hope to follow up on that. I hope we're successful in this in, the, in this endeavor and then follow up on that. We have another uh, thing that we're going to be looking at, which is an idea that I'd like to explore uh, around bringing, uh, in a sense, what I call pre-faculty here uh, to try to find a place of some advantage in recruiting uh, with the same idea that, that we need to change who we are as our students change and as our curriculum changes. And so we'll be doing that, but that happens obviously uh, over time. that we're faced with and the challenges that here are here on the table with enrollment, recruiting and retaining more diverse faculty, and particularly uh, being mindful of increasing and enhancing our capacity to 
for justice in terms of justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm wondering how conversations are going um, about the exigencies of climate crisis, because indeed this <laughs> issue really affects everything that we're gonna do, not just in the next year, but certainly in the next three years and, and beyond, and in fact, next week and tomorrow and next month. So I'm wondering how climate crisis is informing some of the discussions around how we're moving forward. So the university-wide committee on uh, that's producing a climate uh, change um, report um, is, I'm hoping, uh, finalizing that work uh, to get it to me uh, sometime later this month. Um, in parallel to that, we have, uh, we will be launching fairly soon the master, the campus master planning process, uh, which will look at our facilities and, uh, and our growth um, and change over time. And so, and then we have in the strategic roadmap goal number five, which is stewardship of place. And so um, my hope is the question earlier about what success like at the end of this year, that these conversations will converge sometime in the spring as we're starting to think about um, allocating resources towards the future. Um, so that's the, where the stage of the conversations, um, but I don't know if the provost has other thoughts. The only thing I can add, I'm not involved in those conversations, so I look forward to learning about them. Uh, but in the context of this uh, round of faculty hires, uh, one th strand that runs through these, uh, the thematic, as I mentioned, uh, is around environmental justice and about the impact of climate change in different communities. Uh, and so there are, this was not proposed as a cluster, but in my own brain, <laughs> I see, I connect dots, I'm a connector. Uh, there's dots to be connected between faculty positions that were proposed, if I remember correctly today, in KIAS, SBS, uh, Cephans, and Cal. Um, and, and I think that, and maybe I could add COE if you think about how uh, educators uh, will elevate the understanding that our population will have about science and, and particularly the science of climate change and what that might mean about how we adapt and address it as a society. But uh, so, you know, that's in there, too. I'm actually going to ask the last question, because this is an issue that's always of grave concern, grave and great concern to faculty, which is budget. Um, I have been part of, because of the work I've been doing with the provost and meetings with the president, et cetera, I've been um, introduced to the approach or some of the approach that the president is taking and, and the work that is ongoing um, with regard to budget and budget allocation and how faculty already are being provided the opportunity to participate in that process. So if you could actually talk a little bit about the processes that are ongoing now and how faculty are being engaged with regard to budget. So I'll um, ask the provost to talk a little bit about uh, how it's currently being implemented and take the opportunity to talk a little bit about how we hope to structure it moving forward. Um, so um, we're working with our CFO and several colleagues to put a, um, a process in place that will have broad uh, university and faculty participation um, that, will be, that will provide some rhythm to the work so that uh, we can, uh, once we establish a baseline, um, then we can, uh, when the timing is right with the legislative process, et cetera, have a projection of what, if any, new resources we would have in the future and then have a conversation about how would we use these resources um, so that that group would then um, make recommendations to the president and uh, inform the way that we ultimately do allocation. So we will have more to say uh, on that process um, probably in the spring. Uh, we're running out of time in the, in the fall, um, but that's how we, we hope um, to structure at the highest level. And then of course, it would go down all the way to the department level. Um, that is one of the bigger, hairy projects that I put on my priority list when I started and that I haven't been able to move very far forward yet. It's going to take a little longer, and that is to, uh, first of all, uh, engage in a... I guess, a, a project of data collection to put together uh, the kinds of information that would be helpful for us to understand how our 
colleges within the academic division are resourced, what I have called college portraits. Uh, some of those data are not easy to put together. We have some elements of that, but need to do more work on that. And that is just the first step, because I feel like, from my perspective, that that is the first thing we need to do, is sort of understand what do we have in place. Historically at NAU, budgets have been incremental. So what we have are kind of historic budgets. I can't even put a time frame on when the budgets for longstanding colleges were established. You know, with the exception of KIAS that was put together recently, there was a recent budgeting process. Everybody, every other unit's budget has gone up and down with the vistitudes of funding and enrollment and, uh, and the other kinds of dynamics that change budgets, most especially in the case of personnel. So faculty get hired, that adds to the budget. People get promoted, that adds to the budget, that kind of thing. Um, by the way, the other thing to recognize is that in the academic division, the budget is almost all salaries. So it is not very f flexible, I guess you could say. Um, so anyway, my idea, my aspiration was, and I hope to be able to do this in some kind of way that what I, what I hope would support fitting in with this larger process that the president will put together uh, for university budgeting is to get a picture of what we have, uh, make that transparent and with uh, academic leadership uh, and, and inclusive of fa faculty senate leadership, uh, get a sense of what we think there should be. That is to say, what is the gap between what we have and, and what would be sensible from our perspective in light of the activities and needs of, of the various areas of the university, and then maybe figure out a way over time uh, to get ourselves to a, a more, um, if it is not already ideal, a more ideal uh, pattern of resourcing. But that is going to take a lot of information and then a lot of dialogue about how we structure that. I have looked around uh, to see what models are out there that we might emulate with some adaptation in some ways, and I have found one that I really like. Uh, that. I've asked, John's been looking at it and trying to see how we could collect data to sort of emulate it. And it's just a model by which if you were starting from zero, how would you, you know, resource uh, colleges based on different forms of information as an exercise to look at how, what we have in relation to what we might think we should have based on uh, certain considerations. So there's a lot more to be done there. Um, and that uh, will certainly not take place this fall. I'm hoping we'll be able to focus on that more in the spring. And something that, uh, that I will bring up is that not every opportunity to participate in budget and budget allocation is stated as budget and budget allocation. The road mapping process that is ongoing is actually part of the budgeting process. And so faculty, we should be participating in as much as our schedules, and I know the timing is because we're at the end of the semester and we're all overbooked and over full, but this is our opportunity to participate in the planning and ultimately the budgeting of the university and the prioritizing. So thank you, President Cruz Rivera, for your time today. Um, that is the end of the first hour. Um, the second hour, again, is a discussion on the teaching stream, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So the second half of this meeting is a discussion regarding the proposed teaching stream. The teaching stream is being worked on by a working group charged by the provost. And uh, the working group is currently being led by uh, Roger Bounds and John Georges. And they're going to jo join us up here. And I know that several members of that working group are also currently in the room and so could also potentially answer questions. Uh, and so. I will hand it off to John and Roger. You need a second? First, it is really, really good to be having this conversation because this is not a new conversation. I'm seeing some nods. <laughs> and there's a lot of folks in the room that have been talking about this for literally years. And so it's an ongoing multiple year conversation that we've been having. Um, there's not really enough time to talk about all the people who have been involved. But what's new, we can't talk about what's new. What's new is momentum created by the ALC process. This got brought up as an important issue, and the existing process has prioritized it as an important issue, and then a task force got created. So we're getting momentum, so that's new. There's also engagement at a lot of levels, so a lot of voices are being heard, and even more so, there's a lot of support at all levels for getting something done, and that's 
That's huge. So with that said, John's going to walk us through a couple of slides, and we'll have some opportunity from the task force because there's been a lot of perspective to get here. It's just a few slides, but it's an awful lot of work and talk and conversation that got there. So we want you all to be able to ask questions and say, why this, why that, why not this, why not that? And then we'll have that conversation and get to something even better. So. Um, and hi all, I'm John. Uh, I'll try to be as brief as possible um, because this is a complicated topic that really touches such a huge part of our ecosystem policies, practices, um, and in many ways, culture. Um, so just starting with, uh, to give you a better sense of the sort of formal charge and the objectives that the task force really started with, uh, really expand discussions within the academic leadership assembly on the creation of a, a teaching stream, uh, and really try to, in the context of today's practice and today's data, um, what are the goals that the teaching stream should fulfill? Uh, explore some of the key decisions uh, in designing such a teaching stream, and really think about some of the trade-offs um, that make what combination of decisions feel like the right one, and really to take all that hard work um, and compose some further recommendations to the Leadership Assembly and the Provost. Um, here is a quick run through of our membership. Uh, hopefully you'll notice uh, a wide breadth of representation across um, different experiences, lived experiences of faculty life um, and a broad uh, representation of disciplines. Um, I'll impromptu perhaps, can I ask you all to just stand um, and, and be recognized for the incredible hard work um, that this has been. Um, a little bit of what we've done so far and how we started. Um, so we certainly uh, took a very close look at our current faculty stream and rank definitions in the conditions of faculty service. Um, we started by looking at current today's data of what do the faculty compositions look like uh, in our colleges. Um, we, of course, uh, carefully referred to prior material from the long history of conversations about teaching stream, uh, both the conversations that have happened in the provost's office going back at least five or six years, uh, at least longer, <laughs> um, and, of course, the much more recent recommendations from Faculty Senate and the NTT Council. Um, we looked at exemplar teaching professor and teaching stream designs from other institutions um, that have, especially in recent years, uh, created uh, such streams. Um, and of course, we consulted with human resources. There are some uh, nuanced idiosyncrasies of thinking through this process um, where we felt that human resources input uh, would be valuable. And just a quick clarification, when we say stream, we're talking about the different flavors of uh, titles that faculty might hold, clinical track, of practice track, lecture series. So we're calling those streams. And then rank is the various levels within those streams. Those terms did get confusing even amongst ourselves when we were talking about it a lot. So we just wanted to make sure everybody's hearing those words the same way today. Awesome. Thanks, Roger. Um, we tried to take a stab at sort of framing this work by starting, well, what are, what are the marks that we want to hit? Um, and, and here's a sense of what those goals were. Um, one of the goals that we thought we could help promote, um, and that's it's related to goal number one, inclusive academic excellence from the emerging roadmap, um, which is to really uh, expand the adoption of high impact practices um, aligned with pedagogical excellence. Um, the second one is, really think about expanding the adoption of practices that support the needs of historically underserved, underrepresented, and marginalized communities. And again, that's connected to roadmap goal number two. Um, and finally, um, and of course, last but not least, um, really enhancing the ability of the institution to recruit, retain, and develop a high quality mission-driven faculty body. And there's a lot uh, more to say, hopefully, um, on that as we maybe reflect in later slides about how we think uh, we've hit those marks. 
Um, so without further ado, and before we dig into the details, it's important to state here that this um, conceptualization, this status update that we'll share about the teaching stream, it's not a locked one, it's not a concrete one, it's not a ossified one. Um, this consultation and conversation is really a part of the process and we're excited to hear um, your reactions to this. Um, but this is sort of where we've crystallized or <laughs> where we've um, reached consensus on today uh, in the task force. So defining the teaching stream fundamentally uh, across sort of two dimensions, uh, broad contributions across a wide spectrum of activities and a fundamental focus on advancing curricular excellence. So you'll see there a definition of responsibilities that capture some of these notions, an expansive breadth of teaching and mentorship activities and an essential mission that is focused on advancing curricular excellence in the discipline. Um, minimum qualifications of a master's degree in an appropriate discipline, uh, but of course with unit autonomy as exists today, uh, oh, sorry, unspecifying other requirements that might be necessary, uh, promotion criteria that are aligned with the responsibilities. Um, and this is in many ways patterned uh, after what you would see today in our faculty stream definitions and coughs. Um, and then some things that you won't see in coughs, uh, but we thought were really important to call out in an explicit way. And that is uh, salary benchmarks for the teaching stream um, in, a, in an aligned way with the clinical and the practice streams that exist today. Um, and for multi-year appointments, aligned eligibility criteria for the clinical and practice streams. Now, those are still being developed, but the recommendation of the task force right now is whatever the eligibility or however the eligibility is defined for clinical and practice streams, that's um, how the teaching stream would be defined as well. So on money and on security, the same. That, that's, that, that's the point being made there. Um, now, of course, there are many implications uh, of this conceptualization across many different pieces um, of what we do, but some of the more direct implications are obviously on the lecturer stream, because in many ways, what the teaching stream does is it takes what a substantial portion of faculty that are today in the lecture stream might be doing um, and it sort of gives it its own unique identity. So a key question is, well, what does that mean for the definition of the lecturer stream? Um, so you'll see here a, a starting point for what this might mean for the lecturer stream, a definition of the lecturer stream as teaching a limited breadth of courses with no core expectation for advancing, advancing curricular excellence. And Earlier, Alexandra and Danelle brought up the fact that COFS is probably has some opportunities for revision. This is just going to create a few more of those opportunities because the ripple effects of defining one and the other. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's where we are today. You'll notice um, there's no salary uh, and multi year appointment benchmark. I think these are continuing active topics of conversation um, as we need to think through. Uh, those topics a little bit more. Um, there's also other emerging uh, recommendations. Um, as Roger alluded to, for sure, <laughs> we're going to need to revise COFs in order to create a teaching stream. But I think beyond that, there are many opportunities for improvement in our current faculty stream definitions. I think um, the fact that what we see today reflects an evolutionary history without, I'm almost sure, a, a pause and a very holistic sort of review and revision of all of the streams in a coordinated way. Um, and we certainly think, as we have delved into those descriptions, that that would be a very much uh, worthwhile effort. Um, we need to think uh, about a reclassification process of not just faculty that may be today in the lecture stream, but also faculty that might today be in the practice stream or the clinical stream into this teaching stream. Um, and then we are also uh, crafting a recommendation to have a continual, ongoing, regularly scheduled, if you will, uh, assessment of whether an individual faculty 
is in the correct stream. We know that needs change over time and what a faculty member does today may not have necessarily looked like what they did a few years ago. Um, and that really tracks, if we're doing it right, with emerging and evolving unit needs. Um, and I think some really important uh, topics that came up in our work uh, that we thought were relevant and areas where we felt comfortable making recommendations um, touch on the broader question about how do we do a better job integrating our teaching focused faculty into university business, into the shared governance processes, into unit governance, into the various committees um, that exist, uh, particularly and perhaps importantly with annual review processes. Um, and also, you'll see on that last point, some of the processes that have to do with, well, who is automatically eligible to serve as principal investigator on grants versus who needs to um, request special permission. And we think there is a spectrum of improvements uh, that we can make on those dimensions. And some of those are going to require COFs revisions because COFs does um, articulate certain requirements. Some of them are just unit practice reconsiderations that in terms of participation of various folks in various unit processes. Both of those need to be kind of on the table for discussion as we're having these. And I, I swear I'm circling for a landing. Uh, now, uh, going back to some of the early goals that I shared, um, we think this conceptualization helps really advance uh, those goals by creating a faculty stream with explicit expectations to advance high impact practices. Um, and uh, high quality pedagogy. Um, we hope to improve compensation benchmarks um, for teaching focused faculty, um, trying to work toward minimizing compensation and employment security divisions among teaching focused faculty, um, really helping us recruit and retain um, faculty, especially in a landscape that is changing with the emergence of more of these teaching professor, teaching stream types of positions in higher education, we think it's a key element of ensuring that we remain competitive uh, for the best talent we can attract um, and really hopefully by promoting inclusivity of teaching focused faculty in the broadest possible spectrum of processes. And with that, question for you. So my question, it's, probably, it's, it's more of a two-part question. Uh, number one, with the hiring of, uh, or the, I should say the conversions and then uh, any future hiring, is this gonna limit the number of tenure track hires that there'll be uh, university-wide uh, since we are focusing now more on teaching apparently uh, according to what's been presented here? Uh, and my second question is does this lead to the eventual elimination of, of tenure? What, uh, what security uh, does someone who gets a conversion, uh, what, secu what job security do they have? You know, there, what benchmark, you know, if you are on the tenure track, you know, you're wanting to achieve tenure, what type of security would, the, would there be for somebody who was on this teaching stream? Well, first, thanks for asking the easy questions first. Um, that, that's, a, that's an interesting comment, and I'm, I'm probably going to punt here in just a second just to have some thoughts, is I don't see that, those being as connected, but I want to make sure I validate your question, because if you're asking it, they're connected in some way. So we need to have that conversation. My first point, and the reason I'm pointing at the provost, is this just gives a different opportunity to have a series or a, a track of faculty that meet different needs. We're always going to have the needs that are met by tenure track positions. And we're seeing that there's another recent investment in that, and I would not expect that to change. And I'm kind of looking, hoping for acknowledgement on it, that that's our goal moving forward. So I don't see those as connected as you might suggest in that question. Is that? Yeah, good questions, Paul. Um, I, I, I agree with what Roger said. I'm just sort of thinking about uh, that, the deepest aspect of your question, which is the future of tenure. I'm not sure I'm ready to pontificate on that right now, but I do 
think that the future is likely to be interesting in the broader scheme of things. I'm not talking about NAU, but um, we're seeing indications in some areas that people are leaving tenured positions for higher salaries or different kinds of amenities. And I don't know that the place of tenure uh, is going to stay so prominent in our own minds is sort of what I'm thinking, at least. Um, I, I agree with Roger that I, I don't see the movement to establish this teaching stream to be in any way antagonistic to tenure as an institution, nor antagonistic to a, a priority as it plays out differently in the colleges around bringing on more tenure eligible faculty. Keep in mind that we do have a clear geography around that. Uh, that is to say, the needs of different uh, areas of the university in light of the market uh, for the kind of people that, that are uh, qualified to be faculty is quite different. So we have whole areas of the institution where there hardly is tenure. And there probably will not. And that's one of the areas where the, the value of tenure seems to be like going down. And I'm saying the value of tenure for those that are seeking positions, such as in health professions, is what I'm talking about. Um, so I don't know that that's going to change. Um, uh, so I think, in my mind, that what this will do is better situate our faculty that have a teaching focus, have a special uh, expertise to bring to bear on pedagogy and curriculum uh, in regards to obviously compensation in regards to uh, clarity of the nature of their appointment. I think it does matter to refer to those faculty as teaching professors uh, because I believe that language matters, symbols matter, uh, and that uh, affiliates, if you will, a designation that has, his, you know, in our culture uh, has been one of honor uh, to the work that, that's being done. Uh, it does not link tenure to these to these to this stream, uh, and so that there will remain that difference. But we just received well, we're in process. I got to be careful. Uh, the board is this week. Hopefully, at the end of the day, Thursday, I'll be able to send out the message that the board of regents has approved a increase in the quota or threshold of multiple year appointments that we're allowed to to give. Right now, we're like right at that ceiling, and we can't go any farther. Uh, what that means exactly, there's some things we have to look at in a numerical analysis, a quantitative analysis, because the board was very clear that they don't want us to, to be, in a way, you know, less than fully thoughtful about how that as different kinds of practices might play out uh, in the event that we have an area that needs to change. Uh, so we do want to move forward with the practice that we've started to implement uh, to the extent that we've been able to, which is to link the multiple year appointments to promotions, uh, which means that they're you know really linked to the strong performance that our uh, faculty in these streams will uh, demonstrate. Uh, how far that will take us in terms of, you know, uh, is it going to be the case that we'll be able to guarantee that every person when they reach that first promotion is going to be able to get one? Not sure yet. We have to look at that to be all to be you know perfectly uh, transparent. Uh, so I I do think that the you know my my experience uh, with our president is that he sees value in investing in more tenure eligible faculty that are teacher scholars that bring together primary or uh, professionally oriented scholarship research and creative endeavors uh, and link those to their teaching. Uh, and so I don't think that you know putting this stream in place would in any way alter that perspective. What how rapidly we do that and the extent to which we do that is a whole nother question that's tied up with that challenge that the president talked about around enrollment and budgets and, and that sort of thing. All right. Um, these questions are from the Qualtrics survey. Uh, I have three questions, so I'll say one and um, respond. Um, so the first will is, will current promotions in the lecturer line translate to similar positions in the teaching stream? 
AKA senior lecturer would transfer to an associate teaching professor? The answer is a quick and easy yes. That was our int intention and that was the general consensus of the entire task force is that's the way it should be. So yeah, C and to repeat it in case anybody else didn't hear that, the assumption is that if you'd already achieved, if you were to transition from a lecturer stream to a teaching professor stream and you'd already achieved promotion once to senior lecturer, that that would translate to associate teaching professor. And, and the similarly for principal lectures would translate to full teaching professor. Thank you. And so the next question is, will departments have final say on terminal degrees for specific positions? That, yes, Renata said yes. So, no. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the inside joke is Ramona's gonna figure all of this out. No, um, yes. Uh, yes, and, and that, is, uh, that was one of the big questions um, that we really uh, spent a, a long time exploring. Um, just like today, departments have unit autonomy to determine what is sort of the intersection of the needs that a position fulfills and how do those needs inform the qualifications necessary. Um, we do not at this point intend or anticipate disrupting that dynamic. And, and the reason for that discussion and kind of making it humorous is there was a lot of discussion on whether or not the teaching stream should in fact require a terminal degree. And the answer was for some units, yes. For others, no, that's not okay. And it's not appropriate based on their discipline, their disciplinary needs, the kinds of expertise. And so that decision remaining at the unit level seemed the most appropriate. And, and just to keep adding, uh, that is what today looks like um, for the lecture stream. Um, the lecture stream at the Coffs Central University level defines a master's degree as a minimum degree necessary. Uh, but in fact, there are units across campus um, whether formally or de facto in practice, have codified a higher than master's degree uh, requirement. Thank you for that. And so the third question, um, so uh, it kind of overlays into the other agenda item as well. Um, so can non-tenure faculty please get it guaranteed that we are valued and that we will do, um, that the university will do everything they can to ensure some of our tenure track colleagues discontinue their tracks on our value. Some tenure track faculty treat non tenure track as second class citizens, and even if we go to equity and access to highlight the abuse we receive, we are told that our non tenure track status is not a protected category. Um, NTT are an incredibly important part of NAU's success. We are just going to see more and more NTT leave. As the administration does nothing to address the bullying treatment from some tenure track faculty, why is that some tenure track faculty can teach poorly, do minimal research, and bully others, yet they cannot be fired, especially when quality NTT faculty were fired during, the co during COVID? So I'll start and then I'll encourage task force members and the provost to uh, comment is that's the reason we're spending so much time and passion and energy on this is because of that value. That, I mean, I hope that comes out. If it doesn't, then we will work harder on that. Um, for those colleagues that are not transmitting that value, uh, that didn't sound, uh, makes me sad. So, and we need to work on that as a, as a community culture. Well, I'll just get out there. I, I'm interested in what the task force members think about this, but I, I would say that that's what's being described there is absolutely unacceptable. Um, and this is a good example where uh, I, I would suggest the, you know, the power to affect that is in our hands. We don't need to change anything to do something about that. It's not a matter of policy. Uh, it's a matter of the culture uh, that we have uh, built in, in some of our academic units, I guess. I, 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 I think I've been around enough to know that that's not uniform, whatever, what's being described there. I would hope it's got a very low prevalence. Um, I, I don't have a gauge of that. Uh, we have, I think it was noted earlier, we have policy frameworks that give units a lot of latitude um, to do one thing or another in terms of how they operate. And 
Uh, I certainly am well aware that there's been some evolution over time from uh, being uh, more, say, hierarchical and more exclusionary to being less hierarchical and more inclusionary. Uh, and maybe we need to inventory that and push people along a little more aggressively, um, if that's the case. Uh, along with that, uh, bullying and, and treating our colleagues as if they're not as valuable as ourselves is just not at all uh, consistent with the values, the ethos, and the expectations that I think NAU has uh, for all members of our community. It certainly isn't aligned with my expectations of what I would hope uh, that uh, our uh, academic leaders would be cultivating. And so, you know, that's something good for our deans and chairs and directors that are here to hear. If that's something that, that's going on in an academic unit, uh, that that be a matter of some proactive intervention of some sort. And if you need help doing that, I'm, uh, we're all uh, prepared uh, to do that. The other thing that I would say about that uh, is it also maybe uh, in a oblique way uh, points to the importance of our peer review process and the rigor of that. If we have people that are not performing to our mutual expectations, somehow that feedback should be conveyed. <laughs> if it's not, and this is an area of shared governance, uh, and certainly an area, going back to a previous point, where chairs are right at the intersection of that and, and university governance, that uh, that needs that system, if you will, or our practices there need to work in such a way that what is being described there would be very unlikely to happen. Um, I'll just say that. Uh, so, I, I, I'm, as the provost said, not acceptable. Second, um, one of the goals I have as a faculty member with many colleagues who are in a position other than tenure track is to stop divining an entire class of faculty on this campus, not by what they are not, mm -hmm. but what they are. And the fact that an entire class of faculty on campus are defined by what they are not contributes to those faculty being treated in the way that that faculty member just described. This is a cultural issue. It's, it's ingrained in our vocabulary. It's ingrained in just how we talk. NTT, the NTT Council. Mm -hmm. So one of the goals, and this would be something I would ask of the working group and of us all, is that we really need to start working on our language and how we refer to our colleagues. Um, I have a few colleagues who have, in extreme frustration, said, can you stop defining me by what I'm not? That, that inherently has an impact on our feeling of value, on our feeding, feeling of importance, on our feeling of inclusion, on all of those aspects. And so it's, it's a culture change, and it's something that falls to the Senate. It's something which falls to chairs and the deans and the provost's office and, and just in general. But be, particularly because this is because we're trying to create a new classification of faculty with the teaching stream proposal, um, I would also say it falls to all of us to really start the work on changing how we refer to our colleagues. Um, because hearing that is very frustrating. I, I would hope for everybody in this room. Um, and, uh, and it can change. It will take time. It will take effort. But um, I know that many of us work with students who are transgender and ask for uh, us to start referring them by a different name or a different pronoun. And we make that transition fairly easily. At least I, I, I have found that I do. I will take my responsibility for that. We can do the same thing for our colleagues. I, I'd actually invite some of our. Yeah, I think I think there's some follow-ups on this particular topic. Roy was. Yeah. So I think one of the advantages of the teaching stream proposal is to help break down some of those, exactly some of those, distinctions that shouldn't be made. 
Um, that's why I'm a proponent of this, of this teaching stream idea. I would also say that, you know, one of the things that's built into our culture, which is a positive thing, is this idea of differentiated workload and recognizing that everyone who works at NAU in some kind of faculty capacity has a, we don't all do the same thing and we get recognized for that differentiated workload and evaluated on the basis of uh, do we do more teaching, do we do more research, do we do, what combination of things that we do. So I, I think, I mean, when I first came here, I thought, wow, that's a really cool idea. You know, other places that I was associated with didn't have that. So I think it's, it's really consistent with that sort of historical idea. Let's value people for what they bring to the table and what they do. And this is just another step along the way to help making that a reality. And I'll pass it off to Donnell, one of, um, it was probably too subtle, but <laughs> one of the efforts that we've made, at least in our task force, is um, to use the term teaching-focused faculty as a way to try to move away from the non-something. Um, I'm sure it's imperfect, and I'm sure we could do better, uh, but it's a start. So um, I have a question about one of the ways that we could value the teaching faculty. Um, what kind of opportunities will be offered for funded renewal? Um, sabbaticals that will allow the teaching faculty to work on pedagogy and content and rethink and rebuild their courses. And the reason why I'm emphasizing funded is because right now teaching stream faculty have a lower salary in a very high cost of living town. And I think that that's an important aspect of allowing people to renew is having a sabbatical that's funded. Uh, that is not something that um, you saw today. Uh, it's not something that I think the task force uh, has had enough time to tackle. Um, but I think in earlier academic leadership assembly work, uh, definitely I think there was support for some kind of structured, funded, uh, compensated um, professional development opportunity. Um, the term sabbatical is a little too overloaded, uh, but I think there's definitely a desire to identify something that we can extend to our teaching-focused faculty uh, broadly uh, along those dimensions. And earlier today, President Cruz Rivera mentioned his fourth of three versions of shared, or three signs of good shared governance, and that fourth one was recognition of the complexity, I think, or something like that, and that's one of them is because fundamentally a sabbatical assignment is a is a fiscal decision there's a lot of that but it's not out of the conversation it was just out of the realm of this particular task force assignment but i do think keeping it in the conversation is wise for sure hi uh thank you everybody for working on this uh, I guess I have a, a question about what's next. Like, I'm familiar with that this is a set of recommendations, but what happens with them? And a timeline or, or I guess anything you could provide would be helpful. Uh, a lot and not a lot of time. Uh, <laughs> I, think, uh, I think the next step um, is for the task force to really reflect on, on the feedback that we hear here uh, and return to the Academic Leadership Assembly and the Provost uh, with our recommendations. Um, what happens from there um, is, I think, up to that group and those structures, but there's certainly a lot to do. Uh, one of the big things with a teaching stream is that um, it does create a new faculty type, uh, a new flavor, as Roger called it, uh, that does not currently exist, either in ARCOFs or in ABOR documents. Um, so we're going to have to go to ABOR um, with this. Uh, so that's certainly one next step, uh, but there's a lot to do to stand this up. And one of the things that we've talked a lot about uh, in our task force is we all feel a sense of urgency. If, if we're going to gain improvements in the lives of our teaching focused faculty, there's certainly an urgency to do so for next academic year. And yes, 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 just to add to that, that uh, one of the reasons to kind of give some focus to the charge of this task force is because of this timeline issue 
if uh, what we need to be able to do is reach a decision and go to the board with a formal proposal essentially in January. Uh, and really, we should have an idea of what we want to do in advance of that. Uh, one of the things that happens in these board processes is that we also consult with our sister institutions. This happened with regard to the M or multiple year appointments. And they wanted to go a somewhat different way. And we worked through in the negotiations behind the scene. OK, you guys do that. We want to do this, you know. Um, and there are, there is conversation going on at ASU, I'm, I'm told by my colleague there around a similar idea, although I think they are not going to end up exactly in the same place we do. So I'm not sure if we're going to be able to coordinate. But I do have an obligation to share once we've reached an, you know, an idea of what we want to go forward with to see if they want to get on board with it. You know, they don't have to adopt it if it goes through. So we have been you know, signaling to the board that this is coming. Uh, so it's not going to be a surprise. I don't anticipate that there would be resistance to it. But we just have to do that in real time. It has to go to a committee before it goes to the full board. And then we have to know about it soon enough to put it into our process to uh, make appointments in, uh, as John suggested, fiscal year 23. Uh, what that might mean about any hiring we do, that's another one we've talked about. I don't know yet. <laughs> uh, it's probably going to matter. It's going to be a point in time thing. But but I, I do appreciate, I will say again, this group has worked really rapidly. And I do appreciate everything you all have done. And I've been pushing on them because of this sense of urgency. And I know that president's ready to act uh, pretty quickly. So once we get a recommendation, get input from uh, the academic leadership, assemb leadership assembly, and assuming that you know, we, we come to a place where we're ready to put forward a recommendation to the president. I'll be doing that as quickly as possible. Mine that ties in well. Um, I'm wondering about potential antagonism in the other direction, that with lecturers, existing or new hires, who maybe don't qualify or advance into the teaching stream, what role will they play under this framework? Based on the, the current understanding, and I'll let the task force members add to this, the, based on the current understanding, most, uh, an awful lot, in fact, potentially all current lectures could fall under the interpretation. It's going to require local unit conversations to confirm that and confirm that that meets needs. But if the unit and the individuals in that unit decide all current lectures in that unit would be eligible, depending on what the local unit decided. There's another one. Has the task force discussed whether or how the teaching stream proposal affects how we define the instructor stream at NAU? In years past, there were concerns that instructors were doing lecturer work. I think that was a two-hour conversation or, or, <laughs> or near about. Uh, uh, yes, it was, it was certainly an active one. Um, again, you didn't see that as a current uh, solid enough uh, answer on that front, but it's certainly something that we're going to have to tackle. There are also some dependencies uh, because the answer to that question likely has very close dependencies on what the answer will be for the lecture stream. So there are some knock-on implications. Um, but at the highest of levels, um, I think certainly one of the guiding principles of this group um, has been a desire to do the most for the most um, and to really strive to gain, um, not just for however large the portion of lecturers might be that would become teaching professors, but for as many teaching focused faculty as we can. And one more online. Um, I heard some comparisons to clinical faculty. Could you clarify that comparison? Since most of us are probably more familiar with tenure track titles, salaries, etc. What is a clinical faculty member? What is a professor of practice? What would it be? I think it's focused on salary. Yeah. So, so when you say comparisons, there's a lot of ways. If for those that aren't uh, in the room, a lot of comments went back and forth on what comparisons we could be making. 
probably the one that's foremost in most people's minds is the money comparison. And what we're recommending is that we decrease the difference or actually eliminate the differences such that, um, uh, not despite, I'm trying to think of the positive word, the, uh, whatever the stream is that's most appropriate for your role is compensated the same and the title is the only thing that differentiates the person and their role because the compensation should be the same. They're just meeting a different need at NAU and that shouldn't be valued money-wise any differently. The separate question is the fact that our current costs and the way our current costs is written does leave a lot of openness for interpretation. And that's what we were talking about earlier is the need to go back and kind of think through those. Right now, there's a lot of overlap between the way those descriptions of clinical faculty, of practice faculty, lectures, and our proposed version of teaching stream faculty will need to have those conversations as we revisit coughs. Our goal right now is to be as, inclusion, as inclusive as possible and to get those equity issues of both pay and job security through multiple year appointments flattened and equal. Does that, I don't know where the, okay. There's also, as I think has been referenced, other stuff to clean up. So there's a technical thing in our coughs that's, I don't know what its origins are, maybe Roger or someone else knows, but those faculty that are in the clinical track uh, who may not have a terminal degree will find that they are not eligible for promotion for that reason. That's kind of odd. <laughs> that, you know, those are the kinds of things in terms of consistency and, and you know, what seems to be reasonable in light of what we want to do now that need to be addressed. Um, and if you, for this question, John, could you go back to the slide that shows, um, yes, this one, responsibilities. So expansive breadth of teaching and mentorship activities and advancing curricular excellence in their disciplines. Now, I assume that that is put under teaching, right? And, I, you know, we support the teacher-scholar model, so scholarship, creative activity, and service would be separate. So looking at that, and I'm thinking like what Roy mentioned of workload, what are the discussions about the teaching load of the teaching stream faculty? To me, this is a, you know, three courses plus all this other stuff is more than enough because, you know, you can't, I mean, for 20% plus all this other stuff, what are the conversations around teaching load? Because this is more in depth, this requires mentorship, this requires you know, you know, pedagogy and all of this stuff in the teaching category. So have you been talking about that? Have you, you know, to me, just another 4-4, we're not even gonna think about it, is not acceptable. So what kinds of conversations are being had relative to load with this stream? You know you're in trouble when Roger just looks at you pointedly. <laughs> um, so, so we we haven't tackled that question in an, in, a, in that explicit of a way. Um, the structure of this presentation follows how Coff's definitions are structured today. So, if you look, for example, at the at the lecture definition or the clinical definition, um, you won't see the type of nuance that I think um, your question really points to. Um, so we haven't tackled that yet. We need to and we should. Um, and there our work will then intersect with the workload task force that is working in parallel. And then I just want to suggest a different interpretation. And um, I, you know, I don't see those things as being different than what we would expect our tenure eligible faculty to do. And they may be assigned in addition to teaching and what we, some of that stuff we'd put into the bucket of service, not all of it, uh, a research assignment. So I guess I wouldn't, I just I caution against interpreting it as pointing to workload because that's not the intention as I understand it. Uh, we expect all of our people that are teaching, regardless of stream, to be thinking about pedagogy, to be thinking, and if they're engaged in the department or units, collective work around the cultivation and stewardship of curricula, that falls into the areas of workload that we already recognize. That shouldn't be a change. 
one of our uh, task force members happens to be a clinical faculty, and when we were discussing this and this came up, I recall the statement saying, that's exactly what I already do, describing that in terms of the teaching roles. So we do need to have these conversations, and it, the workload question is kind of separate. questions online. The first one is, uh, thank you so much for this. It is very exciting. Is there any idea at this point about how many of these positions would be available per current eligible lecturer? All 50%, 10%. And then the second question that relates to it is, can we, um, can we clarify that the teaching stream would be given to all current lecturers? Or are you all saying we will be dependent on our units deciding if we can be moved to the teaching stream? Uh, we have not been discussing any kind of uh, quota or limit uh, around how many uh, reclassifications we would be doing. Um, but. I think we do want to involve the units in conversations about what they think is the right set of reclassifications based on the needs, their mission, the discipline, all of the other factors that may go into this. Um, I do think, as Roger alluded to earlier, um, in our minds, I think exists a world where most of our current lecturers would be eligible for reclassification and perhaps even a few professors of practice and clinical professors to go along with them. Online, and I think we've kind of addressed it, but I'll uh, read it again. I appreciate everyone on the task force seeking input. Thank you. What will be some of the differences between lecture and teaching stream tracks that you can anticipate? We have a full task force. <laughs> um, this, yeah, this really doesn't sound like it works. Um, I think most of us envision it as being as many of the current lecturers as possible with maybe uh, some still staying in the lecturer track um, if they're only teaching, you know, like one kind of course, basically, and not doing much else. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, some of us wanted to just eliminate the lecture stream, but it seems that's not possible. Um, so this is kind of where we, where we landed at, at the current moment where we would love to get feedback on that. Um, but I do want, the, the earlier question about the units I think is maybe worth coming back to because I think maybe one of the concerns is, is related to that earlier question about mm -hmm unit culture and how unit culture may actually prevent people from moving into the teaching stream. And, and our hope is to really define the lecture stream in a way where that's not possible to exploit gray areas between the two streams. So if people are sensing in the, in the broader community that there are still gray areas there, I think we would love to hear, um, hear that and kind of hear how we can avoid that because we really do want to avoid potential areas where unit culture prevents people from being in the stream that they should be in. Uh, thank you, Jeremy, because that's a huge point, and we want to make sure we get the feedback in a way that we can nuance the language. I love the way you worded it, to where possible eliminate that. That's fantastic. So one thing I would like, two things I'd like to bring to the attention, and, and I know you've talked about this, but just for the room and for everybody online, we need to be careful about not creating a lower class of faculty in the process of most of the faculty being moved into a teaching stream or principal or uh, um, um, practice or, or clinical with the unintended consequence of a lower class of faculty. We did that, that's the last thing lecturers, cur current lecturers need is to feel left behind. The other thing is I would recommend that the, that the task for the working group task force um, develop an appeal process so that if a faculty member, if a department, if a unit makes a decision that a faculty member is not going to be moved into this teaching stream, that they can appeal that, pro that decision externally to their unit. Paul. Yes, I wanted to just dovetail off of what Kate was saying earlier about equity. 
Uh, I think one thing to consider is removing the name teaching professor uh, from the title, maybe keeping it within internal documents for promotion purposes, but as far as formal title, you know, externally facing to students, to the public, remove uh, the, ti the title of teaching as assistant associate professor. We're all doing the same job, whether we're NTT or TT, some are administrators, but I think there should be a, a discussion about removing the term teaching from the formal title, maybe just using it for uh, internal promotion purposes. The other uh, just comment would be in terms of the whole teacher-scholar model uh, in that many NTT have done inordinate amounts of research and have published uh, exceeding amounts of work. So I would like to see potentially in this teaching stream some way of recognizing uh, an allocation maybe on the SOE uh, that if an NTT in this teaching stream wants to publish, they can get recognized for it uh, on uh, their SOE. Because I've, in my entire nearly 12 years here, I've had my research count, not count for many, many years, count a little bit, but I can only do so much, even though I was writing way more than my allocated amount. So I think there should be a discussion about uh, rewarding faculty who are uh, writing, who are doing uh, the important scholar component of bringing that research into the classroom. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's kind of related to what Paul and even what Alexander said a little bit earlier. Um, thanks so much for throwing that piece in there as far as teaching stream faculty being able to serve as PI without having to fill out the form. That will be greatly appreciated um, for sure. But also, you know, for folks like Paul or people who have, you know, um, are you implying an encouragement for teaching stream faculty to engage more in research and scholarship and seek out extramural funding and seek out a greater level of research and scholarship within their SOE? Our discussions were not. I'll, I'll open it up. But that did not come up as any kind of intentional encouragement. Paul's question brings that up as, you know, is it intentional encouragement or allowed interest? I mean, there's both of those that play there. Um, neither of those were part of our discussions. Right. I think uh, there, are, there are many different um, reifications of high-level conceptualization. Uh, I think what <laughs> lived in most of our minds was uh, uh, a sense of teaching stream faculty modeling what excellent pedagogy looks like and helping their units advance along that dimension by, again, through that modeling and um, currently, I think in most of our minds, uh, through an emphasis of their service activities along that dimension. Question online? Do you want to move on or? We have time for one more. Okay. Um, so um, the person asking the question is thanking Jeremy. So it refers back to what Jeremy said. My feedback to that point, get rid of the lecturer stream. Have way fewer NTT streams. Creating more streams creates more levels in a hierarchy, and it's hard to distinguish between them. And then of kind of related one is I would argue that foregrounding teaching in the title emphasizes its value and there has traditionally been a dismissal of the value of teaching in comparison to research. That was an online question and, and, and Astrid, as you work your way back to give Jeremy the uh, microphone, I'll say that this conversation has been had amongst the, the group quite ferociously. I might add, with, with recommendations like we, we hypothesize that, well, what if there's just the teaching stream? No lectures, no clinical, no a practice, just the teaching. Because when you read that, 
it sounds like that that that's that wasn't out of the conversations but that kind of wholesale change wasn't necessarily our task either so jeremy yeah i wanted to just quickly respond to kind of what paul was saying that this question and um the the earlier comments by kate about ntt because i think that while while certainly all perspectives that um you know don't like certain terms are important there's also been a feeling when i was ntt and a lot of people i talked to that ntt and, and kind of teaching stream titles were important because they also named a difference in privilege um, that is a reality right this difference between the non-tenure track and the tenure track as something that we don't want to just completely obliterate from talking about and, and when we when we just have the same titles as people who have more privilege than us and get paid more than us and all these other things well, now I'm on the tenure track, so I can't say that anymore. Um, that I think there's a danger there. There's a danger in not uh, in, in in it normalizing that. And so I think the value that that NTT folks have talked about with NTT or maybe even the teaching professor stream is it, it has a value in terms of one one thing we wanted to do is call more of our faculty and maybe hopefully all of our faculty professor. Um, but if we just call them professor, then it's alighting that important difference in faculty conditions that some of us at least do want to eventually get rid of completely, although that's not what we're talking about here today. So the, I just wanted to throw that perspective in there alongside the, the important perspectives of, yes, these are not ideal identities uh, either. And we are at 5 o'clock. So I want to thank everybody who joined us in person, everybody that joined us online for this very important discussion on the teaching stream. This is a, this is a very exciting potential change and, and growth in, um, for, all, for so many of our faculty. And um, hopefully, again, a, a growth in the respect and value that we are demonstrating for them. So thank you again, everybody, for joining us. Thank you for everybody online. Um, I'm going to give another thank to President Cruz Rivera for joining us for the first hour and to Karen, Roger, John, and the entire um, working group for their time today. Thank you so much and have a great afternoon.